we have Derek Monroe with us today. How are you, Derek? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell us a little bit about your career and all that good stuff so our audience are aware of you. Okay, so my name is Derek Monroe. I'm a hairstylist of over 25 years. It's the only career I've known. I graduated high school with my license. I took it in a vocational class in high school. So I graduated with my license and um, I've owned a salon. Um, I have, uh, I later moved to LA and that's sort of how I started into celebrity world just by being in a salon associated with celebrities. Um, I then moved back to Virginia where I'm originally from. Sorry, I don't think I said that. Um, and um, <laughs> I owned a salon for another seven years until I started getting um, people that I had met in LA were people that were here in New York. And so they would um, tend to invite me up to New York from time to time. And so I had the opportunity to come to the Wendy Williams show one day and they introduced me um, to some of the people there and they started using me to work in their guest department. And so then I started working with different people from um, different agencies and assisting them. And one of the guys named Teddy Charles, which was this hairstylist that did a lot of editorial work, um, invited me to be his full-time assistant, got me here to New York and um, as a result of that, he hired someone else and I was still left here to work in New York. But then um, it worked out and I'm not mad. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I basically became a hairstylist here in New York now. And um, I've uh, three Emmy nominations. Um, I have a YouTube show called Behind the Scenes Beauty. And I also work with different brands. So I, I, I guess that's somewhat of an introduction. Yes, uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about how that transition from being owning a salon to jumping in as a freelance hairstylist, because I'm sure that's just like completely different of like having, um, being managing a salon and then going into being a freelancer kind of. Well, the beautiful thing is um, assisting and learning. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in LA and I worked in the salon, you you would tend to go out with the more seasoned stylist and be their assistant. So you learn set etiquette, which I think is very important. And I think it's a lost art for what is happening now. With social media, people are finding these hairstylists and they're just bringing them into the world. Mm -hmm. They're not knowing their worth as far as like what I should charge or even how I should act, you know? And a lot of them are, enamored with the whole fact that they're working with celebrities. So they don't really understand that there's a culture to it. So for me, I had already learned from people that I had worked with. So I knew not to try to be talkative. You don't try to make the person your friend, you know, like you go in, you do your work, you do your work to your best ability and you go home and, you know, you study and brush up on your trends. And so I was well prepared for that by the time it had happened, you know, so yeah. What advice would you give to people who are listening who are trying to get into being a, a celebrity hairstylist that might not know those ins and outs? Is there like a place they can look out for or? You know what? Being a celebrity hairstylist, people always ask that question, like, how do you become a celebrity hairstylist? And to be honest, I don't really know if there is like a path per se, okay. because for everyone, it's different. A lot of people... It's really about placement and where you are. Like a lot of people want to be celebrity hairstylists, but live in Timbuk, Arizona, like, or, you know, wherever. And they assume that one day the, these doors will open up. And it's basically about putting yourself. So if you want to work with celebrities, you then have to either move to L.A., New York or Atlanta, right? possibly Chicago, because they do shoot shows or television shows there. But and you have to sort of, um, for me, when I was back, when I was starting out, I went to a salon that was frequented by celebrities. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's different now. It's so different now because now 
the stylists go to the celebrity. The celebrities used to go to the salon. They don't even do that anymore. Now they just meet them at their home. And, you know, so it's not the whole to do and to die that you used to know about. But um, I used to go, you know, I, so I would place, you know, I would go to a salon and try to be an assistant, just a shampoo board, because you you just want to get into that, you know, area in that arena. Um, but like now, to be honest, it's like, I guess what I would say is go to agencies and really just ask to be put on the assistant list. and. You know, that way, any kind of jobs that come up, you continually learn the culture, but also you become so familiar and that they see your work ethic that when it's time that the stylist, you know, the main stylist that is the star doesn't show up, you're always next in line and they yeah. trust you. They know that you will do the same type of work that they will do and they trust you with their clients and you just become in the mix that way. Normally, that's that's the route. That's such great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's get a little bit into your career with um, working with Project Runway and Wendy Williams. You said that you began at Wendy Williams. How was that experience for you? Well, I worked in the guest department, but it was it was mind blowing because I came from a salon and it was it was crazy because you finally see your your work on a bigger platform. You're used to, you know, your client, you're doing your clients and they're so excited and they're taking their pictures and they're talking about their hair. But this was a moment that you saw something that you did that will live forever walking across the screen. I remember the first celebrity that I did on her show was Stacey Dash, ironically. Um, <laughs> and she was like the first, like she came in, shampoo, so it was like me doing her hair from from beginning oh, to end wow. not just touching it up it was like the whole style was me and I just remember just being so proud of it but um it was a great opportunity I never worked with Wendy but from there I met all of Wendy's team and all of Wendy's people and because I had done a lot of their they would have these fashion shows where she would pull out the Wendy fan mm -hmm. that basically parlayed me into um how I got to Project Runway because I I so the YouTube show that I do now is something that I've always had a, a passion to do back in 2009, 10. And so um, I started following this guy named Johnny Lavoy, who I saw on E! News. And I was like, I would love to talk to him. And so I started following him and he had just gotten a job at L'Oreal as their lead hairstylist. And as the lead hairstylist, he was leading out the team for Project Runway. And so he had posted on his Facebook page one Sunday morning that he was looking he was looking for people to be on the team. And I sent him a, a message and I said, when do we start? And he was like, you're very presumptuous. And he was like, well, let me see your work. And he was like, well, we don't fly people and we ain't putting people. I was like, look, give me the opportunity and I'll make it work. And he gave me the opportunity. And so that's how I started Project Runway. I did it for like five seasons. How was that? That's such a great story, by the way. But like, how was working on Project Runway? Because I'm sure like it's challenging with how that show is compared to doing Wendy Williams or The View. Project Runway was perfect experience. Like, it's funny how everything sort of makes you better for the next thing that you're going to do. And Project Runway built me in speed because Project Runway is very true to the actual what you see on television is true. So when they bring those competitors in and they say, hey, you got an hour in the hair and makeup room, you literally have an hour in that hair and makeup room and you're splitting what was a small, tiny space, which was half hair, half makeup. And what we would have to do was listen to what Johnny was being told for what he was doing on camera and he just ship them to us. And you have to make that look happen in, 20 to 30 minutes or you know and you may had a little time after they got dressed and waited in line to walk the runway but literally you only had 20 or 30 minutes and it could be a moment where they were like oh I want my my model to have hair you know down her back or I want her to have 10 braids and you'd have to make that happen so Johnny was a great person to learn from I call him like the the MacGyver of hair he knew how to like yeah think quick on his feet and how to make it happen and get the job done. So it sort of worked that muscle in me. And so it was, it was a great opportunity for me to learn in quick situations where you have clients that 
they they're running late and they need to look great in 10 minutes. What do you do? And so you just learn these quick hair tricks and stuff on how to make it happen fast. So that wow. was the great idea. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you learned a lot, but I'm sure it was chaotic, um, <laughs> but props to you. Um, talk a little bit about like ha being nominated for an Emmy. You said you were nominated three times. How was that whole experience for you? You know what? The first time you're, you're excited and you're like, because you can't really believe it. I'm from a small town, um, like population, maybe like 700 people or something. Like, it's not a lot. And so... Um, we had like one stoplight. So to go from just being a hairstylist that was doing hair on Saturday mornings for people at your high school to being in a, a place where you are noticed by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences is, is a major accomplishment. And um, when the first time, it is great to just be nominated. Now the second and the third time, now you're like, oh, it's cute. But now I really want the trophy. So um, <laughs> I'm very appreciative. And I could act all coy, but no, I, I'm ready to win. So, um, yeah. But um, okay. it, still is a, it, it still is a great privilege to have even been accepted or even you know, noticed, you know. So it's been, it's been amazing. Definitely. Yeah, we're going to put that on the universe so you can get that trophy. It's time. Yes, right? <laughs> yes. Um, can we talk a little bit about hair trends? What hair trends do you think is like, is happening right now when it comes to hair with celebrities and you know locals as well um hair trends you know what with me and hair trends i feel like it's all about the person like they come out with these things and, and call it a hair trend but it's just something we were just doing two and three years ago you know what i'm saying it's like it it at this point now it just constantly rotates um <laughs> you know, <laughs> into the same thing. You know, I, it's so funny when I look at videos with like Cardi B and, and Meg Thee Stallion, I remember us doing those hairstyles. Like, like the updos and everything. Yes, with the yes. updos the, <laughs> that were like prom updos that people wore for everyday looks. And yes. So now that when I see that that's their cover of the the single and I'm like, wow, how things, I, it wasn't that long ago. And for now I'm really feeling old because I'm like, wow, I've seen something recycle, you know, Definitely. it doesn't feel new to me. Um, but like, I, I don't know when I try to think about this, like when it comes to hair trends, I, I mean, it's, it's all relative. You know, I think I like, I'm one of those people. I do look at the fashion shows and I, I look at, what the artists are doing. And I try to recreate some of that stuff for some of the people on The View, for Sarah, which who I do on The View. Um, and I, I, I mean, I like sleek, but I, I'm also a person that I love a classic blowout. You know, I love movement in hair. I think for celebrities of color, they are trying to really embrace their natural hair. A lot of them are really embracing natural textures where a lot of times there was this whole, you know, trying to keep these sleek, straight weaves and, and looks. And I think now people are really just embracing the textures that they have and really just enjoying who they are as women and men, you know, um, too. So I, I would say the trend is more acceptance of what your hair is doing on its own, basically. Yeah, which is really great because definitely did not see that growing up. And now I'm able to like wear my hair like this and be proud of it. Yes. Um, is there a look, a hairstyle that you are just like, I can't do this style anymore. Like I, I'm constantly being asked to do this and it's getting on my nerves. I, it's not, I mean, okay. It's not something that I'm asked a lot of, but it's something, the lace front wig. Mm. Um, I don't, the sad part is I don't think it's going anywhere because how it helps to maintain the health of hair, True, yeah. um, people's natural hair, if they take the time to take care of their hair. Right. But um, at the same time, something that was done that started out more in a theatrical area, then transformed into more of a celebrity area, then now has turned into a consumer area. 
I don't know if I love the fact that consumers have gotten a hold of it because the look of it on consumers is overdone. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't do any more baby hairs, like extra baby hair. Like, I'm so over baby hair. Um, like, I like it, but I just feel like when it comes to, like, the wigs and stuff, it's like, I, as soon as I see it, I'm like, ah, wig, <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you're going to do it, I just want you to at least learn or just not be so dramatic with it. Like, do it simple, a light or something, but just the extra, yeah. I'm over baby hair. Yeah. I- I definitely feel you on that, which is funny because I was going to bring up, there was one day Sarah on The View did have like a little bit of a baby here on the side. It's like my favorite look of hers. She had like um, hoop earrings and yeah. wearing a jean um, outfit, but yeah. it looked so good on her. That's one of my favorite looks on her. Thank you. Now, don't get me wrong. I love how people take their baby hair and make it a design and stuff right. and all of that. That I don't mind, but I just feel like when it comes to the wigs, like I just want us to get a little bit better at learning how to camouflage if we're gonna do it. And once again, I don't know if I love that consumers have gotten a hold of it. You know, we saw, you know, sadly we saw Beyonce start this trend of these lace fronts and everybody was like, how do I get in there? Everybody was like, oh, it's a wig, she's paying this money for it. And everybody tried. And so the recreation of it is always, you know, it's true. Like the, the, the baby hairs are starting to look like a little like Michael Jackson. You know how yes. you have like the baby hair sleeked and it's just it's, it's getting a little bit. Long. Yeah, it's a little out of control. So let, let's take it back. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite look that you've done over the year? I know you said you were really proud of doing Stacey Dash, but is there a look that you keep? But wait a minute. I'm not proud. That was a proud moment of seeing. It, it wasn't <laughs> like doing Stacey <laughs> Actually, oh <my> <laughs> It actually was because I grew up watching Clueless and it was one of my favorite movies. So that was the moment. But when I think of like favorite looks, um, you know, I recently did a variety cover with Whoopi Mm -hmm. and that was a favorite because we used textured wigs that was different from her wearing her locks that she's so iconically known for. So for her to be like, hey, bring, you know, some different hair and like, let's see, let's play around. And for us to come up with that look, that was that was a moment for me because I knew people saw her differently, you know, in a different way because she'll do it for a part. But for her to do it where it was representing her and the article was about her and it wasn't like, oh, this character, you know, that was a moment. Um, Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that was a great spread. I, I love that one as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about your show, Behind the Scenes. How did you come up with the idea? You said you've been wanting to do it, but what really put you into thinking about, let me do it now? So, well, when I started it, it was just like, let me just see if I can do it. Mm. Uh, it was more of a challenge to myself. But I have, Behind the Scenes Beauty is something, like I said, since 2009, I had always wanted to do. Um, because I grew up watching uh, Behind the Music and uh, Lifetime's Real Women and all of these shows that sort of told these people's stories. And, you know, to hear people's triumphs as well as their failures, I think helps us all. People's testimony, you know, in church, we, the Bible even says, you know, I'm a little church. Uh, the Bible tells us that we overcome by the word of our testimony. And I think that that's how we grow off of each other by you telling some of the things you went through as well as some of the things, you know, that I went through. And so it basically helps me along my journey. So if you're telling your story as a host and you tell me you went to 10 places and 10 people told you no, but then this amazing opportunity opened up here and this one person and it took you to stardom, it, it, it encourages me that when I hear those no's, that I realized no doesn't mean never, it just means not you, you mm-hmm. know? And so um, with Behind the Scenes Beauty, I wanted to, my whole life is to like, how do I better the people around me and what energy am I giving out and how am I making the people feel? So with that, I wanna give beauty and all of that stuff, but I also wanna encourage people on their journeys. And 
I want people to feel encouraged and that just how so-and-so did it, you can do it too. Because when I started out, there was no blueprint. Like going to LA, there was no, there was no one to tell me how they got, like you're asking me how to become a celebrity. There was no one to tell you. You didn't really know there were any avenues or any type of uh, materials for you to figure it out. So hopefully through behind the scenes beauty, people are encouraged, inspired, and it gives them a little um, energy to go on to their journey. Um, have you ever had like journalism uh, background? Like, did you go to school for journalism at all? No, not at all. <laughs> Okay, but your interviewing style is amazing. Like I was wondering like, oh, did you go to journalism school at one point or? It's great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. What I think is, once again, I think God places you in places and the view helps. Like mm -hmm. I pay attention. It's so funny because now I work with L'Oreal and some of the content stuff that we've been doing requires me to read off teleprompter. When I'm at The View, I sit there and when Whoopi's teleprompter is going up, I'm reading it just to see how well I would flow with the teleprompter. Um, watching them and seeing how they navigate those conversations, you pick up. So I think God places you in position for your next position. And so your, your responsibility is to absorb everything. And, and I want people to really get that because even in what you think is horrible situations absorbs the education of that situation so that when you go to what God has for you next, you'll be prepared and you, you don't, you don't even realize how you'll use it. And so I think learning to watch people in a talk show host space mm -hmm. has helped me do my own. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, you're really great at it. People are so vulnerable and open with you. I think it's really great to have that ability. So I think it's yeah. great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite guests that you've had on the show? Um, you know what is interesting? I don't, I do the show in a way of like people that I just am, I enjoy and I feel like they have something to contribute. So I don't know if I could say like there's one person, you know, that is like a pinpointed person that who's interviewed, because I take something away from everyone. Um, I recently did an interview with Miss Lawrence um, and to see their progression from a hairstylist to an actor and a mm -hmm. singer. And in our conversation for them to talk about how they always wanted to do that, but didn't feel like that there was a place for them because of his femininity and the way he dressed and the way he presented himself to the world, he never thought that there would be a space for that. Mm -hmm. So to see him go this route because it was an accepted space, he, he did hair because that was a place where he could wear his clothes and mm -hmm. do his hair and all that and it wouldn't be uh, scrutinized. And then God opens up a door where he gets to now still be all of that yeah. and now uses other gifts of being able to sing and act. So, um, you know, that and um, it's so many of them, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, that I take away, but that one is more recent, but like, you know, uh, I'm, I love talking to Sergio because Sergio's a small town guy and to see how his taste and, and and how he's grown this business and how he's dressing the first lady and yeah. you come from being a person in South Carolina and, and trying out for a show, he started out on a reality show that initially turned him away. Mm -hmm. And then they called him back and then he wins the show. Like it's these triumphant ones. So I, I think I take something away from all of them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I take something away from them all. Uh, my personal favorite, and maybe because I'm biased because I love Wendy Williams, but Wendy Williams' interview with you was pretty um, amazing because she was so open with you. But I also love the fact that you asked her about um, the notes she left in her wigs. Yeah. I always loved that and so sad that she doesn't do that anymore. But um, how was interviewing Whit uh, Wendy, actually? So Well, first of all... Even though I started out at Wendy, I had no real interaction with Wendy. Not only did it, it wasn't even like, because you know, like at The View, 
you might not work with Whoopi, but you have interaction because you might be there and you see her around. Yeah. Wendy was someone I never had real interaction with. I And she knew who I was because she came to our show. I'm very good friends with her makeup artist. Well, her whole glam team, but her makeup artist, Morel Hollis, which actually was one of the person that pushed when she was doing her press. That it was like, hey, you got to do behind the scenes beauty, which I'm so grateful for. Wow. So when he did that, First of all, I was nervous as crap because you're interviewing Wendy Williams, the queen of talk, you know, and you have someone that you feel like is doing, you're doing what she does. So she's judging what you're doing. So you feel some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Um, But, and so I really, I felt like, I guess I was expecting her to be on guard. I was prepared to feel like I had to do this dance. And when she just started just, talking and releasing I was like uh what's going on here <laughs> but I was so grateful and it was it was an amazing it was an amazing interview it was one of my favorite and then I'm so it's one of those things that I'm so proud of in this time because it was one of the you know it was right before her she's not been able to do her show so I, I take that as like a portion of 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 a treasure for me to be able to know that I had this opportunity to interview her and to always have it and to look at it and to be able to celebrate her. Cause it was a moment where I got to tell her how amazing she was. She's one of the few people that can get in front of a camera and just talk right? and not have an audience, but just give you what she's thinking. And it sounds you're entertained and you'll right. sit there and listen for an hour mm-hmm. off of what she's thinking in her head, you know? And so there's no one like her and I wish her the best and I pray that she's in good health and great spirits. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, there would be no celebrity bloggers if there wasn't Wendy Williams. She paved the way for that, you know? Yes, she definitely did. And all of them are just imitators now, you know, to a degree. It just all, and it all feels like everybody's trying to be Wendy, you know? Exactly. Yes, very much so. So I definitely hope that she knows that she's loved and getting all the flowers that she deserves right now. For sure. Um, So how do you um, hope that behind the scenes beauty is impacting other Black individuals when they watch your show, whether it's creators or actors or hairstylists? Um, I'm hoping that they see see themselves. Um, I'm hope, and and that's why I love, I call it behind the scenes beauty and it's not just a hair thing Mm -hmm. because I think there's beauty in the journey. And Mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that they're, appreciating the beauty that comes in their journey that we're always focused on the destination but the real you know and that that's even when it comes to if you're a hairstylist a makeup artist and a person that works in this business when you when you're putting that person together to go out before the people whether it be for a photo shoot a red carpet or whatever the beauty is the creativity of everyone harmonizing together for a common good and it's that journey and that build up that's really amazing and so I'm hoping that people are walking away with that that they're being encouraged by you know a person like a Wade Menendez that's a barber that is that took what most people only like the whole dream and hope is a barbershop where he's made it a book he's on talk shows he's you know he's giving classes and he's he's monetizing it in a way where he's making it this huge huge business and brand and so I'm hoping people are inspired to take what someone else is doing take the baton and make it even bigger you know um a a person that may be a model like a Cynthia Bailey that thinks like you're in the last part of your modeling career and here comes something else and even when I interviewed her She was just now leaving Housewives. So she was in that space of like, what's next? But to see, she just started, did an acting role on a Lifetime movie. So I'm hoping people are like seeing that, don't be discouraged. Even though things seem like it's not coming together right now, it's coming together. You just got to hold on. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And as a Black hairstylist, I'm sure you have face a lot of challenges in the industry that should be aware of. Can you share a little bit of any adversities that you've experienced? 
I think a lot of it is just people not thinking, people limiting. People, for black hairstylists, people don't realize when we go to beauty school, we learn on white mannequins. Especially when I was going to school, we did not learn hair. We didn't learn black hair. Black hair is what we learn within our community. Mm. But when it came to education, they teach you European hair. Everything is how you cut straight hair, how you style, how do you perm, like all of that stuff. So I think people limit you and people think Mm -hmm. that because you're a black hairstylist, you only know how to do black hair and they only bring you on to do the black clients. Um, But so I've had those moments where people push you to the side. And what's funny is I've even been a black hairstylist working for a major hair company doing a commercial and seeing them hire white hairstylists that had black assistants. Mm. So you got to realize because of their book, they are, you know, they, they giving you this, they, they're multi, you know, they can do all hair textures, but what they're smart is at, they're not doing the hair. Right. They're bringing on these black assistants to do the hair. Wow. Then they get up there and tweak it and whatever. Mind you, they've made the deal for, the thirty thousand dollars or whatever that, and then they're paying the assistant probably five hundred dollars for the day. You know, so it's I've seen all of that. So I'm I'm hoping the day will come where we're not limited to only just doing black hair. Um, I'm excited for the people like the Lacey Redways that are representing Tresemme, which is a huge company. She's a black woman, but she's representing it on a global scale. So I'm excited for people like her that are getting these opportunities, but I think there definitely has to be more. Definitely. Um, And how did you navigate with that? I know that has to be a struggle for you to be like, "Um, I can do it all. Why am I only being um, sought after for just this? Like, how did, how did you deal with that eternally? Um, Well, and I mean, I'm one, I'm a person of faith. So I'm one of those people that I think things have to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And you also have to show people and you have to just believe that your time will come and you'll be able to show that you're much more than that. And I thank God that those opportunities came about, you know, Um, and that there were people that didn't limit you. You know, when I started at The View and Sarah would be like, Derek, I want to see what you would do with my hair, you know? And so... I was like, okay, you know, and we were those people, you know, that were like, you would try different stuff and everything isn't a hit and everybody don't love it. And some people say it's too black. And right. that's, a, that's another thing too, that like that line of appropriation or like who owns the rights to what it yeah. styles and all these things. And I get it all. And it's just, I just, I, I, I need us to figure it out though. Because there are certain things I'll do and they'll just be like, oh, like if you put extensions in her hair, I will get messages where, oh, you're trying to make her look too black girl or I've gotten, (laughs) I have gotten all of that. So it's just interesting how people through lenses, people see. So you really have to, um, how have I handled it? You just have to build a tough skin. You just have to keep your focus and know what you're doing and what your purpose is and just create the art that w- is within you, you know? Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. And do you have any stylists that are out right now that you really admire what they do? I admire, well, okay, so the OGs, which okay. is Chuck Amos and um, Chucky Amos and, and, and Oscar James, because they are the pioneers but they're also still just as relevant today. They haven't skipped a beat. I don't look at their work and think, ah, they should hang it up. You know what I'm saying? Like I I had the opportunity to interview them on Behind the Scenes Beauty. And it was because I remember watching, you know, looking at, to find out that they were the ones that were doing all the hair on the dark and lovely boxes and the color boxes. And I remember being in the salon and people bringing in the box and saying, I want this haircut. Yeah. I want this haircut and this color. Yeah. And just how much they really had inspired and, and made an impression on the black community on a, 
global scale. Because, you know, people everywhere are taking these haircuts and these looks and wanting you to recreate them. And it's because of them. So um, they are people that I love. And like, I love Nick Nim, Nikki Nims. And there's another um, young lady, Nikki B, which is a nurse. And it's not even hair, it's not even her full time thing, but she's just amazing. I love people that are creative and know how to walk that fine line between every day and um, editorial. Mm. So, and I feel like those are, are people that do it. Like Ursula Stevens, uh, of course, I appreciate her. Um, it's, it's a lot of them that I, I just think are out here killing it and I appreciate them. Jawara, who is um, now an editor at, I, I don't even wanna say, I think he's an editor at ID, but he does all the fashion shows, a lot of the major fashion shows now. So yeah, those are, you know, and I love that about him because he's in that space where, you know, it's not a lot of black mm-hmm. hairstylists leading out fashion shows, you know, and it's normally the same people all the time every year for all these fashion shows so to see him be able to be a part of that lineup is very exciting nice yeah that's great to hear and we come to the part of the show where we're going to ask you some quick questions okay uh, and you give us a quick answer for them okay um what quote do you love um and you know what i y'all had given me this question to to (laughs) think of (laughs) so that i would be quicker with it but i (laughs) I <laughs> not think of a quote that I love. Um, you know, in do in um all things will happen in due season. So mm-hmm. maybe yeah. That's a good one, I think. Uh what was your last Google search? Erica Campbell, because I've been I I do all my my pull-ups for behind the scenes beauty. So she's on she's the next gospel singer, Erica Campbell from Mary Mary. So because mm-hmm. she's on my next episode, I've been Googling her all day for different pictures and stuff. So yeah. Great. I can't wait to see that interview <laughs> when it drops. Okay. What is the cringiest trend you've tried? Okay. So pri- like when I was maybe like 22 years old and I wanted locks, I went to this lady to try to get lock extensions and she put these spiral curls in my hair with like hair glue. And I, I was like, that's what it's going. She was like, no, no, it's going to look fine. And they were literally synthetic spiral curls. And I remember running to one of my friends. I was like, because I was so embarrassed and I was running and they were springing like, like telephone cords. <laughs> you look like a little bit like Shirley Temple almost. I looked like I was on the good ship lollipop for sure. <laughs> <laughs> She's wrong for that. She's really wrong for that. She was. She set me up. I mean, I literally... Put it in and took it out. So yeah. <laughs> what animal are you most like? A giraffe, because I'm six foot four. I don't know if you can tell it, but I'm six foot four. Yeah. So I can always look over everything <laughs> and I'm unaffected by anything below me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could not tell that you were six four. Wow, I'm jealous. Yeah. Uh what is one product you cannot live without? Now, that's funny because it depends, like, are we talking for me personally or my hair or are we talking about, like, for my clients? If we're talking about for me. Oh, yeah. Oh, so now I'm big on, like, root touch-up spray because I'm, like, with my color, I'm always, like, touching up my roots. So root touch-up spray is something I can't live without. <laughs> and um, for my clients, I just love dry, dry shampoo and dry texture sprays. I just love movement in the hair and stuff like that, so. I love those kind of a spray, yeah. Okay, I have a question about dry shampoo. Now, as a black girl with natural hair, can I also use dry shampoo? You can, and they have, now they have, um, Dark and Lovely has one, actually. Mm-hmm. When, when I, I, I don't work with them anymore, but I used to work with them, and they have a dry shampoo for uh, natural hair. And also, um, there are a lot of other lines that have colored shampoo. So mm-hmm. it's not the white. You right. can get it in browns and stuff. So okay. definitely, I think, yeah. Okay, I'm going to look into that because I definitely have tried it once and it was just like white. A white. Yeah, yeah, it looked like it was growing gray. Yeah. <laughs> I I, I, olive, um, what is that? Olive oil or whatever. I think they, they used to make a great one that was in a brown. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if they even make it anymore because I don't ever see it. But 
I, I got it when they're in a the kit and it was, it was great. Okay, I'll have to check that out. And the last one, what advice do you give to anyone that's listening to make it to the top in your industry? Um, to just be consistent, have a great personality. I always say your personality will carry you places, talent won't. I've seen a lot of people that weren't amazing hairstylists, but they were great people and they made their clients feel good. And a lot of times people don't understand if you're in a celebrity situation, those are high pressure situations and moments. Mm -hmm. So people hire people that make them feel safe, that they can depend on for their business, you know, their personal business don't get out and that, you know, ha the, the person has their back. And so, you couple that with great talent and studying up, studying up on your craft, you, you will go leaps and bounds in this industry. That's always good to hear. And I feel like most people think it's only the talent, but it's definitely um, oh, no. your personality and, and people trusting you. So yeah. Yeah. Cause right people want to see you win. You know what I'm saying there? If you, and that's just sometimes being yourself, like not trying to be the star. I think a lot of, people because people see what celebrity hairstyling is now is not what it was you know what i'm saying um it's sort of gotten muddy because of social media so now the the celebrity hairstylist is the celebrity so now they're it's what they are wearing and where they're going and private plane and all of this and that's cute and all and i get it and i yada yada but the truth of the matter is you have to be prepared to give up your life because you're living in someone else's life. You know what I'm saying? Like your schedule, especially let's say you work with a Beyonce. You better plan your life around Beyonce's tour, Beyonce's uh, award season, Beyonce, like your life is dependent on that. And a lot of times you stick with everything, you cancel everything because it's gotten to the point you don't want to miss a day because you're scared the day that you don't show up Someone else is going to come in yeah. to fill in for you and take your spot. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you also have to believe that what's for you is what's for you. So I hope somebody got anything out of that part. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree with that. Like if you don't show up for something, someone else can take your spot. And, and that was one thing Wendy Williams always said. She was like, I'm going to work every day. So every day. And, look, job. The, and as soon as she didn't go to work, look, man, they gave her show to share a show. See, she told the truth. <laughs> She told the truth. She did. And we are witnessing it. Yeah. They give you one or two days. But you, <laughs> and you know, and it's sad because I know hairstylists and makeup artists that will refer someone that isn't good mm. just so that they can secure their spot. I'm wow. not that person, but I've seen and I know people they will be like, mm-mm. You'd be like, oh, why didn't you refer someone? So, uh-uh. Because they'll be and have my client. And I'm not that, I, I mean, I'm one of them people, I believe. The funny thing is, it has happened to me, but oh. <laughs> it's one of them things. I'm one of those people that have said, you know what, if, if you belong, if you were supposed to be my client, then you were supposed to be my client. And so right. if it's time for us to part ways, it's just time for us to part ways. I'm not going to live my life in that space, you know. Well, I do like that we got a little bit of tea in there. <laughs> yes. <know? laughs> Derek, it's been so much fun talking with you and learning more about behind the scenes beauty and your career. And I am rooting for you to get another Emmy nomination. And hopefully you Thank get the you. I actually submitted for behind the scenes beauty this year. Actually. So I submitted for hair, but I also submitted for show and I wrote our theme song. So I actually Ooh. submitted. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll, we'll see what happens when those nominations come out. <laughs> okay. I'm rooting for you. Okay. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.